So uh, that's kind of, I'm going to now kind of, quick questions about pre -vis, and then I'm going to kind of shoot it over as far as the post -vis. So essentially pre -vis is almost like a uh, little microcosm film crew inside a larger film crew, in a way? In a way. Yeah. And it, it, what, a lot of times what, a, a terminology that is starting to come into play that a lot of directors and stuff, or you'll start to hear is, there's pre-vis and then there's something called tech-vis. Mm -hmm. What tech-vis is, is basically what you're suggesting. is like, that's when you start to figure out, okay, how do we physically do this? And then we have heights and cameras and how do you raise people and lower people and, you know, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If something works in pre-vis and the director goes, I want that, yeah. do you then take that and sort of shine it up to work in the film or do you rebuild everything with nicer models. What we do is we send that off to a, like a larger facility, like, I mean, Mike and I did this on Tomorrowland. We send it off to ILM. Mm -hmm. ILM takes our cameras, takes our crew models, and then they do exactly what you said. They operate the models, they keep our cameras. Um, you know, it was, it was kind of nice on, um, on Battleship, we did, uh, we did a lot of things, and uh, Pete Berg was the director, and he liked our previs and our posters so much that he called ILM and said, look, I don't want you to change anything. Just make it look better. <laughs> I don't care. I want the boat in the same location. I want the water height the same water height. I want the camera the same speed. Don't change anything else. I will AB this over the post -vis, and if it is accurate, I will approve it based off the look, but I don't want you to touch anything. Now here's ILM, which they are the greatest, they are the greatest animators. They did Star Wars, yet they are being told to take our animation, to take our cameras and our information because Pete liked the way that it cut together in his film. He just wanted it to they look better. They are embellishing is what they do. Mm -hmm. They make it look better. They embellish yeah. it to mm -hmm. high res, because these are low res proxies that couldn't be put in. Yeah. In answer to your question. Yeah. So I mean, so that's kind of you answered your question. They yeah. basically take it and they make it look better. Mm -hmm. and, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I know I've done some pre vis in the past, and it was always string crew, no textures, nothing. And I noticed you guys have a lot of textures. Um, is that pretty normal now for you guys to texture it and kind of shine it up a little bit? It's, yeah, and a lot of it is because, you know, I mean, when you probably did it, I mean, there wasn't OpenGL, there wasn't DirectX 11, there weren't game engines, there weren't, uh, you know, there isn't the ability to do a play blast at, you know, you know, 25 frames a second, you know, I mean, like, you can actually write it. If, if we get to a point where our renders are taking longer than 15 seconds, then we have put too much time in our textures. We need, we still need, so that's why we never hit the render button. We never hit the render button, we play blast everything. Uh, if you're familiar with Maya's play blast, it basically is just doing a RAM preview. Uh, and that's what we do. And we, and then we take it into After Effects and we will add, you know, post effects to make it look better. But again, we're doing, on average, per artist, we have, like I, as a supervisor, I expect my artist to produce six to seven, six to eight shots a day. That's anywhere from 120 frames to 240 frames of animation, and that's what that's the turnaround time. So we need it to be fast. So we don't want the limitation of the machine or the render power. So do you ever have a director that gives you like specifics, like I want it to look like this? Yeah. You know, we, we do end up going off of what concept is, so we'll get concept art and then we'll match that. Um, and we've had directors, I mean, we just worked on um, the last Hunger Games. Um, they didn't want us to have any textures because, unfortunately, this is going to sound bad, our textures look too good. <laughs> and they were worried that in the test screenings, because, you know, the studio that was doing the finals, they were doing a different look, and they didn't want them to view it with that in their head, which makes sense because if you watch something like this, you get accustomed to that. That's why, you know, if we're going to do lighting, we wouldn't want to do a day shot and be like, oh, we're going to make it really cool and make it at night, and then show that, and then all of a sudden the director is like, or the visual effects is, well, this was always a day shot. You've always seen it at night. You're going to automatically think, wait, that doesn't make sense. So you will get people still asking for. I want it plain, no shading, no shadows, 
Uh, sometimes they even say we don't want any animation. We want uh, just the state of chess pieces. Right. So I'm going to add something to the. Uh, I want, can I add something to the onset tech biz? Sure. What, what's really important about tech biz when you get the the correct, let's say, techno cranes or the correct cameras. Uh, what happened to me on the show was that the previous people, not this wonderful company, but another individual, they didn't have, they did not put in the correct camera crane for the complicated set. We had three type of cranes, and they were all wrong in the previous. And when I got the technical crane information from the camera place, I saw that it wasn't correct, and they had to redo all their previous. So it's really important as artists to make sure you have the sets correct camera lenses and cranes, whatever, and that they were making up shots that were impossible to film in the real world. That's the danger of previous. You have to make sure that whatever you do translates to the real world on the set, they can actually do that crazy crane move. That was just a bad experience when we had film. Mm -hmm. Is it, so the level of detail that's needed for those technical things is quite high? Yeah. Do you guys and have like a quality we, control? Someone who checks well, we have that. rigs that are set up with a techno crane that have all the extents that so that way we can't go beyond what the rig is capable of doing. We also have to recognize that our rigs are absolutely perfect, and rigs out in the real world aren't perfect. So if you've got a rig with a with a twenty foot boom and it comes down, it's going to bounce at the bottom, and we have to kind of recognize that that's going to happen and actually have to animate with the with the knowledge that it's going to bounce. Also speed. I mean, you know, yeah, you, speed. Are, you think, okay, wait, I, can, I have this length, I have this, and I can make things like that. No, you got a guy with a wheel going like this. It's like, we've had camera operators look at it and say, no. <laughs> Another, another, you know, another good thing I just want to stress on on previous when the, the advancement of just where technology and where we've come is, is I mean Google Earth is amazing because before scouting would be like you get on a plane and go somewhere. Now, I mean, a perfect example is is that um, on on Battleship, uh, Pete wanted to do this big destruction scene in China. So we got in Google Earth, drove around China, figured it out, found a location, and the great thing about it was is he was able to also pre-visit, get it figured out, get it to the government and say, look, I need these streets for this amount of time. Can I have it? No. <laughs> so that is a lot easier than us going out there with the crew and be like, hey, we're going to shoot here. <laughs> no. Or, worse off, the reason why they wouldn't let us shoot there is because of the content. I mean, we blew up China. And they were like, we can't, no. You know, I mean, you want to have like a nice stroll down the park, great. But if you're going to have an, like an alien astro, or astro, uh, uh, alien <laughs> shit crash in, no. You know, so it was one of those things where we were able to show and understand, okay, well, you can't do this. Okay, well, what can we do? And then they said, you can take this building and you can have it crash in here because it will go into the water. So then that's what we reworked. And it was much easier for the six of us with Pete to do that than to, so Google Earth is also, you know, let's just Google Earth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so you don't travel, you know. Yeah. So now, you know, so the next part of previs is is after they've gone and shot, and a lot of times, as you can see, this room is blue. Well, a lot of films now are on blue. So how great is it that you have these great performances with actors, and then all of a sudden you sit down, you show the film, and there's only blue. So this is where Mike comes in, and he basically takes previs to that next level. Right. So previs, as Chuck just explained, is everything that happens before you go shoot the movie. Then they go out and they shoot the movie, and we start post uh, Previs is very much a director's tool. The director is in there all the time, and he sits there and he, and he, and he makes all the changes. This is what I want, because I'm so brilliant. That's what the directors are. They're brilliant. That's just, they're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> then they go shoot the film. No, I'm not angry. Um, <laughs> They shoot the film and then it comes back and they start to edit the film. And post is very much an editorial tool. 
Um, an editor is now working directly with the director, but the editor is now controlling what is going to get put together. And he looks at all these takes that the director shot out, on, out in the world and puts them together into a cohesive, coherent story that the director potentially was distracted by some other thing that was some shiny object. <laughs> I'm kind of down on directors. Okay. Yeah. Um, but so post -biz, um I'm, I'm working with the editor a lot more than I ever see a, uh, a director. So um, what I'm going to do is that uh, we're going to show another reel um, from the stuff that I supervised on World War Z. So um, you can pull that. That'd be great. Thank you. This is one of those things where um, the, the what we're doing is that we're filling all of this plate photography and trying to go and combine things. There were thousands of fake zombies in here, and um, it was it was a uh, it was a tremendous amount of fun. But there was so much stuff that was going on um, that we had to go and green screen, blue screen, put it all together. Um, to go and give you the scale of, of everything that was going wrong in the world. Um, and, and then you had small little moments like this where they, they wanted to drop guys off a building. Um, here, here on Life of Pi, this is one of the other projects I've, I've been involved with. Um, uh, just a tremendous amount of work. Almost every single one of these shots of the kid on the boat was uh, blue screen. So we had to go and track the boat, and not only did, did they, uh, what was it, was it tracked, it also had to be in stereo. So we were doing stereo tracking, stereo work. You don't see it really represented here, but we actually did stereo posters. They did some stereo previews as well, but um, the, the, the 3D was very, in, in Life of Pi, was very much a character here, where all of this stuff had to be accurate to, to for for Ang Lee to, to get his vision to 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 show the how much depth was was occurring here. And so all of this stuff with the that you see with this post is was all actually done in stereo. Yeah. And all of this blue is a tremendous pain to do. Um, <laughs> because you can kind of see here this there's, there's uh, dark spots and water that we had to kind of mush into to make it um, so it's really hard work, but we have to do it really fast. <laughs> so, you know, and going off of that, I mean, this kind of goes to what I was saying earlier. I mean, imagine watching this entire film with no, you know, no lions, no zebra, uh, and blue. And you watch the film and be like, um, what is this dumb? This is dumb. I mean, it's like, <laughs> oh, talking to a... Uh, is that a grapefruit? Um, you know, and then so for us to come in and do something like that, now you're like, oh, wow, there's a storm, you know, um, and there's a zebra. Um, you know, it really does then kind of sell it so that they can, again, like what Mike's saying, I mean, quickly we can do 20 shots a day and get it to rhythm and cues and make sure this tells the story. This got to cry. This made you scared. This made you really, really emotional. You felt bad when the zebra took it. You felt you know? small. You felt small here. You felt how isolated he was from the rest of the world. Oh, crap, there's a shark. You know, they... <laughs> <laughs> um, shark wasn't there. We added that. <laughs> we made that story point. Um, so, it, it, that hyena was there. Uh, yeah, that one. <laughs> 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 how much of the water did you previous and how much of the water was real? But just what you just the, just the tank. The tank was, the you know, water. Yeah, the did tank was 100 foot water in the pre the post -vision? Oh, yeah. All, all, so, so right here, here yeah. everything beyond the tank. So everything back there. We added water. We yeah. added water. And um, it was, you know, we had, we had a water simulation that, you know, a, a very simple one that wasn't super complex. You can kind of see the same thing kind of repeating. Um, but some of it was plate. And we had to go and use all of the same stereo tricks that Rhythm and Hughes did to kind of soft split that stuff in. And it, it really, that's a real tiger. Yeah. That's Richard Parker. And that's me. 
That, that one was, yeah. That was all the budget. Um, but the, the, the stuff that Rhythm and Hughes did really did deserve the Oscar just because of the, uh, just, just, just trying to go and match the water's edge to the real plate water was stunning. Um, uh, you know, and we try to go and do, uh, uh, get as good a possible comp as we possibly can. And sometimes, you know, we sit there and say that we want to do five and ten shots a day, and that's absolutely true. But there are some shots in this movie that were 1,800 frames long. I said five or ten shots, 100 frames long. Yeah. And so it really bothered me when I was working on the show that I was getting one shot every day and a half. And that was because I was doing 1,800 frames twice because it was also in stereo. <laughs> So and they were and they were they were so long and they were so hard to do. It was just uh, again it was genuine hats off to everything that rhythm and music did because it was just just stunning. Um, All right, sweet. <laughs> Did you think we're ready for this? Yeah, actually, Craig worked on some of these shots. Craig is in the studio now. Oh, very cool. Um, so, again, this is another shot, another movie for me, um, Prometheus, where we had to uh, do a lot. Of, all this work was also in stereo. We did stereo uh, posters on this, and it was just an absolute pleasure to sit there and get to work on that on that ship, on these on these plates and. and the movie's gorgeous. I mean, there's some story issues. What did my pride write it? But it was gorgeous. Uh, it was a gorgeous film, and uh, we 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 got to do a lot of really fun stuff. Um, you know, and and to to kind of speak to the fact that again, it's an editor's tool. I, I never talked to this guy. I, mean, I never I never saw him, never met him, never talked to him. I just dealt with the visual effects supervisor and visual effects producer. And the, the same goes with uh, Tomorrowland as a post viz suit. I never talked with Brad Bird, not once for 11 and a half months. Tech did in pre viz, but I did not in post viz. And yeah, I was okay with that. I got, you know. Uh, what was it, um, when it kind of cuts over, what's that, like, on the big alien guy? What's that, like, yellow, kind of static? Right. It was, what it was, he said it was a look, because he was supposed to be a hologram. Oh, okay. So what we were doing was, we had to, uh, uh, have the actor. We had to have the actor as part of the thing, but have him be a hologram. Okay. Um, okay. So most of the stuff that we did was all the kind of hologram pre post mm -hmm. um, kind of come up with looks and design. Um, based upon some of the art and try to execute. So they actually had this big seven foot man actually on set. They wanted to, to use him, but then we, so what we did on this was that we had a model of that guy and we rotomated him doing his stuff and then we put a bunch of effects on that um, and then, so that way it would come to the, come to the visual effects to kind of show that it was a, 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 a hologram and it was, we did some really cool work on this. I was, I'm really proud of the guys that, that, that are on my team because this this comp was probably like uh, 15 different rendered layers out of Maya stereo that got comped, and we still had to go and put out four or five shots a day. Mm -hmm. wow. So so it's like 30 layers with the stereo. Yeah. 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 So it's just double work. Not really much money anymore. <laughs> or time. So, um, but again, what we're doing is that we, on, on all of this hologram stuff, we're trying to go and show um, what it's going to, not just what it looks like, but if it cuts together well. And the editor, you know, um, we're, was really, really happy with the work that we were able to do. And then uh, one of my guys sat there and came up with the, the little, electric green electric stuff on the on the panel there and this stuff here and it's almost exactly like that in the film and it was just like we just we just influenced 
some of the art design. They didn't have that stuff in the art. We just they, they said, oh, add something. So we did. And uh, it ended up showing up in the film, not too disparate from what we did. Yeah, I mean, it, it does go, I mean, it goes back. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, like, Priva is, is, you know, the director trying to figure out how to tell the story, and, you know, and post is an editor trying to figure out the story that he also wants to tell, like what Michael is saying. But I mean, at the same time, we do have a huge influence on creating what that look is. I mean, like uh, right now, um, you know, I'm working on a film where, you know, an entire film is on blue, and it's you know the editor is coming in every day and saying so. What do you want to do with this? And it's, you know, coming up with the idea, well, what if we did it, like, you know, in a big, giant rose bush? And, you know, and it's, you know, and, and we have a lot of characters running around this way. And and that will then get handed off to ILM, and they will, actually, no, so Sony. And they will, um, they'll have to recreate kind of what I did. And a lot of the times, what we're doing, just so you guys, like what you were asking, uh, at the end of the week, I will package up all my Maya files with my assets and I will send them off to Sony and they'll take my work and they'll just make it look better and take ownership of it. Um, <laughs> you know, which is fun. <laughs>